Are there any children here this morning? A couple. I've, left, I've lost my ukulele. It's somewhere. I looked for it this morning. and couldn't see it. Someone's hidden it. So we'll just have to sing. I'll just pretend. Ding. F sharp. Ding. Jesus knows that little children can't sit still for very long. So we'll praise him by our actions as we sing this merry song. Dance for Jesus all around. Clap your hands, make a great big sound. Jump for Jesus everywhere and then come out and find your chair. Very good. All right. If there are any other children here, you're welcome to come down and join us. Lots of folks away this morning. Maybe people are on holidays. Maybe. Maybe people are scared. That's all right. Okay. Scared of COVID. Lots of people are sick and worried at the moment. That's all right. God bless them. We're here, and that's good for us. All right. And if you're watching us on the video, hello. Everybody wave to the camera. Hello. We love you. We miss you. Come back and see us soon. All right. We, every week we read a verse of Scripture together that reminds us of what Jesus said. Let's read together. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. This verse reminds us about what Jesus' main message is, that people should repent, turn away from the things they know are wrong, and believe him, trust him about what he says about God. And he says some more about himself. So let's read together some more words of Jesus. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And if Jesus, the great King, came to serve others, then we should serve them as well. All right. Well, this morning I thought we might play a game. Beginning of the year. Need to get into order and learn to do some things. We're going to play Simon Says. All right? Simon Says. So would you like to stand up and play Simon Says with me? Do you know the rules of Simon Says? Stand up. If I say Simon Says, you have to do what I say. If I don't say Simon Says, you don't have to do what I says. Does that make sense? So Simon Says, do what Simon Says. All right? So Simon Says, wave your hands in the air. Simon says, clap, stop clapping. Simon says, jump up and down, clap your hands, wave your hands in the air. Some people got caught out. Simon says, stop jumping. Simon says, stand on one foot, stand on the other foot. I didn't say Simon says. All right, very good. Simon says, stand up straight like you're on parade. Simon says, salute. Very good. Three cheers for the queen. Hip, hip. Oh, I didn't say Simon says. All right, thank you. Put your hands down. Thank you. That's the end of our Simon says game. Simon says that Simon says is over. So who's Simon? Simon huh? is like we don't know who Simon is. He's just the guy that we say is in charge of what says. Who should we listen to? We should listen to Jesus. What does Jesus says? Jesus says. What do you mean you don't know? What are some things that Jesus says? That's right. He's... Repent and believe is the first thing that Jesus says. That's right. Jesus says we should repent and believe. And we should turn away from our sins we should trust him. What's another thing that Jesus says? Jesus says we should love one another. And Jesus says, yes, we should love one another the way he has loved us. He loves us with a big love. We should love each other in the same way. And that means serving others and helping them and being kind and helping people when they need help. That's what love's about. And Jesus says, follow me. What does it mean to follow Jesus? Any ideas? Any ideas what it means to follow Jesus? What do you think? To do what he says. To do what he says. To live his way, yes? To believe what he says. Yeah, that's part of it, yes. Yes, what do you think? Um, Nothing? Okay. Anybody else? What does it mean to follow Jesus? 
I think these are all good answers. To follow Jesus means to do what he says. Um, to take up your cross with Jesus. Yeah, he says, take up your cross and follow me. He doesn't promise it's going to be easy, but he says, everyone who follows me will find life and life everlasting. So I want to encourage you this morning to think about what Jesus says. Don't listen to Simon anymore. Let's not care so much about what Simon says. Let's listen to what Jesus says. And Jesus says, calls people to follow him. All right. And Jesus says to be holy. That's right. That's the last one I had there. To be holy. He says, be holy the way God is holy. Any ideas what it means to be holy? What does it mean to be holy? To follow the Ten Commandments. Follow the Ten Commandments? Oh, kind of. That's kind of a way of being holy, I guess. Any other ideas of how it means to be holy? Hey? To be more like Jesus. To be more like Jesus. I think that's a much better answer. Well done. Jesus is holy, and so we should be like him. In fact, Jesus said we should be holy the way God is holy. And people go, well, that's really tough. God's really holy. But Jesus calls us to be like that. Do you know the Greek word here which we translate holy means to be mature? No, we're not, some people here aren't very holy. Some of the old folks aren't very holy either, I can tell you that just quietly. But to be mature means to be fully grown, to become what we're meant to be, to be mature, to be proper, to, be, to reach our end goal. And so when we're being holy, it means Jesus saying, grow up, but to grow up in a good way, to be all that God has made us to be. All right? So I want to encourage you to think about that. Jesus says, be holy. So we'll play, let's play Simon Says again, but this time we'll say Jesus Says. Ready? Stand up. Oh, Jesus Says, stand up. Except I'm, I, he didn't say that. I'm saying that. So Jesus Says, repent and believe. Well, how do we repent? Maybe we go down on one knee yeah. and we give up our sins. We say, I'm sorry, God, and I trust you. All right? And God, Jesus Says, love one another. So because of COVID reasons, give someone in your family a gentle hug, a Christian side hug. That's very nice. All right. Jesus says, follow me. Off we go. We're following Jesus. We should be walking towards the cross. That makes more sense. All right. Walking, following Jesus. And Jesus says, be holy. So how are we going to be holy? How can we symbolize being holy? Let's put out our big muscles. We're growing up and being mature. Stand up as tall as we can. We're going to be holy. We're going to be fully grown. We're going to be the way God wants us to be. All right. That's my message for you this morning, kids. Thanks for being part of our family. We love you all. I think we've got some worksheets. Have we got some worksheets? Up the back, go and see Miss Rose. She's got some work activities for you. And I'll hand back over to Lyndon and the group. Let's keep worshipping. To that word and to the message. The notes, please put your hand up. Someone will bring you our notes. Ah. I wonder what comes to your mind when you hear the word discipline. When I sat down to write a message this week with the word discipline, uh, I've had an awful lot of trouble because I'm not very disciplined. And when I have to write something and I don't want to write it, it takes a lot of work. So let's see how we go this morning. Let's pray to start with. Father God, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts, you'd open our minds to hear what you have to say to us today. Father, I pray the people listening would hear your voice and not mine. Jesus' name. Amen. I confess I don't like the word discipline. It conjures up ideas of punishment, of getting in trouble for doing the wrong thing. For years after leaving high school, whenever I saw a police officer, I would check to make sure my shirt was tucked in. There was something about seeing a policeman that went, oh, I'm in trouble. Oh, my shirt's not tucked in. Oh, I'm in big trouble. The fear of getting a detention was firmly entrenched. Alongside that fear of punishment is my dislike of being told what to do. 
I visited a museum once in America where you could stand in a little phone box kind of thing and listen to a Marine Corps drill sergeant shouting at you the way they shout at the recruits on the first day. You could go into this little box and have them shout at you like you can imagine in the movies. You might have seen the movies where they do that. I stayed in the box for about five seconds. It was awful. I had to get out of there. It's one of the many, many reasons I could never join the military. I don't like being told what to do, and I certainly don't like being shouted at. And then there's sport. Sport takes discipline, training, and practice, and paying attention. I've never been much of a fan of sport, playing it or watching it, probably because it takes too much discipline, too much hard work. And the benefit at the end isn't that great either. whoop de doo we put the ball in the net. Or through the hoop, or over the line. Yay! I've never understood sport. It's just not in me to care about it. And the fourth place that I really don't like the word discipline is where it comes to diets. I'm not good at controlling what I eat. In fact, if you've been watching me for the last two years, you've probably seen that I'm getting fatter and fatter and fatter. Uh, two years of, of pandemics and lockdowns and quarantines and all the rest, it takes discipline to say no to the food I like to eat. It takes energy and effort. Is it really worth it? So altogether, I'm not a big fan of discipline. But there are a few places where I am or have been quite disciplined. For example, I brush my teeth. Where did the picture of the tooth go? Oh, he's missing. There's supposed to be a picture of a man brushing his teeth there. My apologies. I brush my teeth usually three times a day, sometimes more, at least two times a day. I always, go for, I always have as long as I can remember. And my teeth are in pretty good nick as a result. I actually went to the dentist yesterday, coincidentally, and the dentist says, you've got really good teeth. And I think, yes, I do. I work hard at it. No fillings, no problems. I don't floss, by the way, that's a scam. But brushing, absolutely, without fail, I brush my teeth. I'm also quite disciplined with money. As a child, I always had money in my money box, and usually more than my brother and sister. When I was in primary school, we had a rule in our family that primary school you got a dollar a week, and in high school you got seven dollars a week. Well, my brother and sister made it to high school and they would still come and borrow money from me, the primary schooler, because they would waste their money on frivolous things like spending it. Whereas I believe deep in my heart the best place money can be is in the piggy bank. The idea of spending that money on something else makes no sense to me at all. I'm quite disciplined with money and then I got married. And that happens. <laughs> Strike one. I've got two to go. We're doing well. Something else I'm quite disciplined with is killing flies. If you've ever been near me and a fly has been buzzing around, you might have seen me reach out and grab it and kill it. I'm pretty good at killing flies. It's something that I, it's my spiritual gift. And living in a house with many children who like to leave the door open, we often have flies in the house, and it's my job to hunt them down and get rid of them. Uh, the other week we were driving along and there was a fly in the car. And Tali is going like this, trying to kill it. And it flew into the back. And Dorothy's in the next row, and she's trying to kill it. And it flew past me, and I went, whoop, squashed it and flew it out the window. One go. So if you ever want to know what I'm good at, I'm good at killing flies. I'm disciplined in my fly killing. And I have been quite disciplined with my Bible reading. By the time I was 12, I'd read the Bible through front to back a couple of times. I'd have a bookmark in the Old Testament, another in the New, and I'd read two pages in each section the night before I reading another book. I love to read, I love to read books, and, and in those days as a young man, as a child, I would always make sure I read from the Old and the New Testament before I read something else. These days I've got three bookmarks, one in the Old Testament, one in the Gospels and Acts, and one in the Epistles. And I aim to read a chapter each every, from each every day but I'm not as disciplined as I used to be. I find there are more distractions in the 2020s than I used to find in the 1980s. 
probably because there's a lot more to distract me now. and I have a lot more to think about as a middle-aged man with a wife and kids than I did when I was just 10 or 11. So I'm not a fan of discipline in some areas. And I find it quite simple in others. Here's my controversial take. It is easier to be disciplined in things you find interesting or things that are of value to you, things that matter to you. Sport does not interest me. Having all my teeth does. So I find it hard to be disciplined in matters of sport and easier in matters of dental hygiene. One of the interesting passages on discipline comes from the Apostle Paul and is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. The rest of chapter 9 and indeed most of the book of Corinthians is about Paul's passion for seeing people saved, for proclaiming the gospel and witnessing the church do its work and using its gifts and sharing the good news. 1 Corinthians is a book about getting a dysfunctional church back on track, back on mission, Back on message, and that message is Jesus Christ and him crucified. And in chapter 9, Paul talks about his personal mission, his personal destiny. He is compelled, he says, compelled to preach the gospel. He says, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. And then he ends the chapter with a sports metaphor. He says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run? but only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer punch beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. He's drawing a metaphor from the games. The Romans and the Greeks loved their games and their sports. The Olympics started in those days. And athletes train hard, and they work hard for the sake of a crown that will not last, a medal that goes around the neck, or in those days a laurel leaf that would go on your head. Paul makes the point, how much of a greater crown awaits Christians? There is a reward for working hard in the faith, he says, for growing, sharing, and loving. The reward of seeing others meet Jesus, of becoming more like Jesus, of knowing Jesus more deeply and intimately here and now. This can seem like a challenge to our faith. We believe that we're saved because of what Jesus has D-O-N-E, what he has done, not what we do, D-O, do. That is, we believe we're saved by grace through faith, not by works so that no one can boast. And yet here is Paul, the apostle who is the champion of grace, calling on Christians to work hard, to win the race, a race which he says we've already won, by the completed work of Christ. Is there a contradiction here? Not at all. It's just the backwards way of Jesus, his upside-down religion. In Ephesians chapter 2, we read the words of Paul, again, in a different book. He says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Then Paul goes on and says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. In every other religious system on earth, people are called on to do works, good deeds or religious activities, so that God will love them. And Then they get accepted or forgiven, or whatever it is, is the goal of that religion. The deeds come first, and then acceptance. But in the way of Jesus, everything is reversed. Step one, God loves you. Step two, God gives life and forgiveness and acceptance to everyone who wants it through Jesus Christ. 
And then step three, God works in his people to do good works in the world, to get us to fulfill our destinies, to get us to become the reason we were created. So Christians are people who do good works, who put an effort into spiritual discipline, not to make God love us, but because God loves us. Because God has done everything for us in Jesus Christ, we make the effort and strive and develop and improve and grow and purify ourselves because we are loved and accepted and have a purpose. And that's going to take some work, some effort, some discipline on our part. We are going to have to run in such a way as to get the prize, which is disappointing to those of us who do not like running. And I could tell you many stories of my high school career of trying to avoid running, like the time we took a pack of cards on the cross country or the time when we decided to jump over a fence to get out of running that bit of the loop, the time we crossed the road to drink some water from a neighbor's tap because the teacher had run out of water when we got to that bit. But I'll skip all those good stories for another time. I want to talk this morning about marathons. Has anyone here ever run a marathon? Oh, one person put his hand up. Doug, have you run a marathon? Really? Well done, Doug. A couple have put their hands up. When I was a young man, uh, I lived in Germany for a little while. I was an exchange student. And the lady whose house I was living in, she loved to run marathons. It was her big goal in life was to run marathons. And so in the middle of winter, she'd go out and run in the snow. And One day she took me with her. And I can tell you, you can run a lot further in the snow because you don't sweat. <laughs> nice cool air comes in. You can run for ages and ages and ages. And so if I ever have to run a marathon, I'd like to do it in this much snow. You know, marathons are named after a battle in ancient Greece. The Greeks beat back the Persians, and a poor chap ran all the way from the battlefield at Marathon. He ran all the way to Athens, 26 miles, to tell the good news that they won. And then he promptly fell down dead. And then another bunch of people thought, oh, that's a good story. You know that thing that killed that chap? Let's do that for fun. The whole thing is ridiculous. I think it's fair enough to run all that way if your side has lost the battle. You could run and let the people know the enemy is coming. The Persians are coming. Get out. Pack your stuff. We lost. Get out. But running all that way after winning the battle? Pace yourself, man. It's no good winning a war and then dying a few hours later because you just wanted to be the first to tell people about it. Madness. And then running a marathon. People just go out and do it for fun. And that's not enough for some people. They want to run double marathons or triple marathons. There are people who run 100 kilometers in a day. And then they get up tomorrow and do it all again. Just in case they ever need to pass on good news about beating the Persians. Just in case all the phones and bicycles in the world suddenly stop working. Madness. But they have discipline, these people. They work hard at their chosen sport, and it might come in handy one day. You never know. It's a bit like David in the Old Testament. You know, David, the shepherd boy, who finds himself delivering cheese to his brothers in the army. And here's the challenge of Goliath, the giant, the Philistine. Philistine. I can't remember. Which way did we vote? Philistine. David volunteers to go out and fight the giant takes five stones with him. Why did he take five stones? In case the first four missed. That's right. He goes up with five stones and his sling and whoosh, 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 bonk. He swings it around and hits the giant on the head and knocks him dead. Sometimes we talk about this as though this was the very first time David ever touched a sling. As if the whole thing were an incredible miracle that could not have failed. Don't get me wrong, it absolutely was a miracle. But the miracle was that David was brave enough to volunteer, brave enough to fight his way through the bureaucracy to make it to the battlefield. He'd used a sling before many, many times. It was what he did while he was off watching the sheep. He didn't just sit there twiddling his thumbs. 
He was practicing with his sling to chase off wild animals and for sport and for fun. He was always mucking about with a sling. He was an expert with a sling. And suddenly, when the kingdom needed an expert with a sling, here was a young fellow who knew what he was about, who knew for sure which way was up. He put his discipline, his practice, his interest to a greater use. What's your interest? What's your discipline? What's your marathon? What's your sling? What's your gift? What is your part to play in the kingdom? The reality is that we won't all have the same discipline. And the church has tried and failed for centuries to try and get round pegs into square holes, and it doesn't work of saying to people, you must read the Bible this way. You must pray in this way at this time using these words. Of trying to connect people with God in this very tiny, specific way. There are very few universal keys. Very few things that work for all people for all times. The way I read the Bible, the way I pray, the way I worship, may not work for you, and that's fine. Find the way that does work for you. Find the way that does connect you with God. And once you find it, do it, and do it well. Some folks are sprinters, and some are marathon runners, and others are designed for slinging rocks. And some of us are good at brushing our teeth. Whatever gift it is that you've been given, use it, practice it, do it. Are there any questions this morning before I conclude? Anything you'd like to ask me about or anything that stood out to you? Over these next few weeks, we're going to be talking about spiritual disciplines, different ways of connecting with God. And I'll be giving examples of ways this can work and I want to emphasize that it's not going to work the same way for everybody. We are all of us built differently. and That relates to how we connect with God as well. Some people love the old hymns. Some people hate the old hymns. Some people love sitting in silence, and just meditating on the goodness of God. Other people, would, that would drive them absolutely insane. Some people feel connected with God as they're walking in the bush or in the forest or along the beach. Other people find that sweaty and dirty and smelly and the sand gets between your toes. You find it very distracting. It doesn't matter how you use your discipline. It doesn't matter which discipline you use. It matters that it connects you with God. And if it's not connecting you with God, try something else. But I want to tell you that there is a way for each and every one of us to connect with God. Just because my way of reading the Bible doesn't work for you doesn't mean you should never read the Bible. Absolutely should. Find the way that helps you hear God speaking. And I'll talk more about that in the weeks that come. I want to finish this morning with a passage from 1 John. In 1 John chapter 3, John writes this. He says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are, John says. We are the children of God. We're not just called the children of God. We are God's children. He says, The reason the world doesn't know us is that the world didn't know him. John's having all sorts of trouble in the world of upsetting the church and persecuting them. And John says, it's all right. The world's going to persecute us because they never knew God, so they don't know God's children. And Then he goes on and says, dear children, now that we are children of God, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. 
John says that we have a task to do. We have something to achieve, something to work towards, to purify ourselves, to grow, to become more and more like Jesus. To purify themselves, just as he is pure. By God's love, we are children of God. We are heirs of the story. God's story of raising up a people through whom he works to establish his reign on earth. Going back to the ancient Israelites and continuing up to the present church. And John states that all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. We are already children of God, but we're not yet fully manifesting this identity. It's not immediate. It's something we are working toward in the future. Our thoughts, our heart, our actions and character don't fully align with this truth. John says that if we have this vision, we will move in this direction, even though it's delayed. And our spiritual disciplines are the way we cooperate with God to move us in that direction of Christ-likeness. They help us to become the Jesus-looking, radiant children of God. And the more concretely you see this, the more power it has to motivate you to invest in your spiritual practices. And so we pray, we read our Bibles, we serve others, we fast, we share, we love, we worship, we grow. Because we want people to meet Jesus. And so we want to grow to be like Jesus so that others will see him in us. We want people to meet Jesus. So we're going to grow, we're going to share, we're going to love. My song this morning to finish with a prayer time says, Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus. To reach out and touch him and say that we love him. Open our ears, Lord, and help us to listen. Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus. Because I'm convinced that the more we see Jesus, the more we know him, the more we will want to be like him. We want to see him. We want to know him. We want to have that passion to grow like him. And as our passion grows, our discipline will grow as well. Let us sing this morning. And as we sing, I pray that you would pray this as a prayer, that you would see Jesus in a new and different way. Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus, to reach out and touch him, and say that we love him. Open our ears, Lord, and help us to live. to see Jesus. Father God, this morning, that is our prayer, that you would open our eyes and help us to see Jesus, that you'd open our ears and help us to listen for his voice. Father God, I pray this morning that you would place a fresh passion in our hearts, that you would encourage us once again to take up those disciplines that perhaps we've laid aside, to pursue you, to pursue the likeness of Jesus Christ, to celebrate in his goodness of all that he has done for us, and use that as a motivation to work for him, to live for him, to follow him. Father God, this morning we want to be people who do what Jesus says. We want to be people who are holy, the way Jesus says we can be holy. We pray this all in his precious and powerful name. Amen. Amen. I invite our worship group to come and join us again on the stage for our final song. If there's anything I've said this morning you'd like to speak to me about or ask me about, or if you're in need of prayer this morning,